Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Dave Rowe. He's going to talk about the time that he spent playing bass for the great Johnny Cash. There was a guy here named Hugh Waddell, and he was working for uh, Cash as his publicist, and he was a good friend of mine. And he rec- Johnny had decided to go back to upright bass because he'd been carrying electric the whole time. And uh, I never played upright bass in my life. I barely knew what rockabilly was. I sort of knew what the slap thing was, just... Hugh convinced him that I was the best slap upright bass player in the world, and uh, which I wasn't. So I borrowed a bass, and if you know anything about music, if musicians are watching, it's all one five bass. So I could fight my way through it, but no slap. And even if you're, even if you're just playing eat shit country bass, boom, boom, boom. At the end of that night, I couldn't even move my hands anymore. I had almost had to go to the hospital. And all the guys in the band were looking at me. They kept waiting for the slap to happen, and it wasn't there. So Cash called me over and said, you know, he said, you really don't play upright bass, do you? I got totally busted by him. And he asked me why I took had the nerve to take the gig when I really couldn't do the gig. I said, man, I needed a job. I had to get out of what I was doing. And I just took a shot at it. He said, well, I'll talk to you tomorrow at the airport. And he came over to me and he just said, and this is, is, this is tes- testimony to how great a guy Cash really was. He was really the nicest person I ever met in my life in the music business to this day. He just said, you think you can learn this stuff? And I said, well, I kind of know what it is. I guess I'll give it the best I shot I can. He said, I'll give you six months. And he did. And it was never brought up again because I got home and busted my ass until I got as good as I could ever get at it. And it changed everything about my career. I went from being just a guy that could plink around on an electric bass to a guy that could bring it upright to the sessions or do whatever, and it just expanded my whole thing. So I owe everything where I'm at right now to cash. I owe everything I own to cash. I own all of it to him. There were three guys in this town at that time, especially Mark Winchester and and even Roy Husky was still alive then, that could have just walked in and done it in their sleep. And they were like pretty freaked out that I got to get. In fact, when I got home, a couple of days later, I got an envelope from the house of cash and I thought, uh-oh, he's changed his mind. This is probably a severance check. And it was a check, but it was for $3,500 and a little note, which I can't believe I didn't keep. And just said, here's two bass players. One was in uh, Branson, this older guy named Arky Phillips, who did the advanced, real showy kind of slap stuff. And Kevin Smith, who still plays bass with Willie Nelson now. He said, take this money and go take some lessons. And I did. And I'll never forget Kevin going, how come you came down here to study all the way from Nashville? And I said, well, I got the gig with Johnny Cash. He went, oh, that's supposed to be my gig, man. You know, it was funny. And Kevin and I are great friends. So it's, but that's, that's how it started. It just, I had to do it and I had to get at it. And I studied it all and did it. Yeah. And I played on some big rockabilly. I just did Setzer's new record and all that stuff. So it's paid off in the long run. I was 20 years younger than everybody else on the gig, and those were some legendary players in that band. I looked up to all of them, especially W.S. Holland, the drummer, who became a dear friend of mine. But it had to be some of that because towards the end of our touring days with Cash, I got my friend Brian Farmer the gig uh, as his tech. And he's, every night he would stand with me and Brian before the show and hang out, and he wanted it that way, and nobody else would come near us. So I suppose that was his little safe space before the shows to hang out with us. And we had some great conversations, you know. It was fly dates. It was all commercial airline and some private jets, and uh, which I learned to love. And when I got the, after I left Cash, I got the gig immediately with Dwight Yoakam. And I did five years of private jets every day. And I don't regret it. <laughs> I mean, I get it now why people like that stuff, you know. Yeah. But really what a private jet does, it's glamorous and everything, but after you ride it a few times, it just becomes run of the mill like anything else. But what, what private jets do for artists, and a lot of people don't even think about this, is you don't get tired. You don't get the shit beat out of you by the bus on the road. You know, for example, if we were playing in Miami one night, we could stay the, all day the next day till five o'clock and fly to Houston and be there in an hour. And we would literally drive your car up on next to the jet and get out and leave it running and It'd be waiting for you when you came back. I can get used to that, and I'd do it. I, you know, uh, ninety-two until he passed away. I can after he came off the road. I continued to play on almost all of his records, and uh, I did uh, the Rick Rubin stuff. I played on most of that, and uh, I was the last man standing as far as the bar was concerned. Everything erupted in the lawsuits and all kinds of crap. You know, 
the way things do sometimes. And I didn't feel like I had a right to do anything. I was the baby in the band. So he kept calling me for everything, you know. It was incredible. It was just so, we went from uh, playing performing arts centers and high-end clubs, you know, just what you could call the graveyard of legacy acts, you know, when he'd become a legacy act, actually. Then when Rick Rubin decided to do that thing, which, you, as you know, now has been copied by a million producers, finding the old guy and, you know, giving him his props or whatever. But uh, he understood what was happening to him, and he was really glad about it. And it was he got a lot of blowback from his traditional crowd and a lot of blowback from his his uh, his administration, if you will, his companies, because he left the Carter family home after that. We went from being a 15 piece touring outfit back down to the Tennessee three plus him, which was so punk rock. It was just it sounded take away all the extra relatives playing acoustic guitars and stuff. And it just sounded like a punk band. You know, because it really was, you know, and uh, you're not going to believe this, but the loudest band I ever played with in my life. And I grew up playing eight piece funk bands in the 70s and hard rock stuff on the side for original projects and stuff. The loudest band I ever played in was the Johnny Cash band. It was, you know, that's just impossible to imagine. But uh, I used usually two SVTs, two 810 cabinets, and Cash would come over and still ask me to turn up playing upright. So it was the drummer of W.S. Holland, you know, the fluke, you know, he had two giant monitors and he was completely deaf by the time he passed away. I mean, just couldn't even hear anything because of that. Bob Wooten played a Fender Twin with all the knobs on 10. It'll peel paint at two miles of Twin Reaver. That's one of the loudest amps ever made. And I, I was stunned when I got that gig and started playing with them going, Jesus, this is loud. Oh, my God. You know? And Johnny had a little special voice of the theater PA just for his rhythm guitar. And his rhythm guitar was it was ferociously loud. It was, once again, almost a lower-level metal delivery, you know? Yeah. He loved all that. I mean, he loved the attention from all the major rock stars who suddenly discovered him, you know, which was bullshit. But guys like Rick Rubin and... A lot of the guys that came around, then Henry Rollins and people like that, they got it. They knew what was happening there and what was always happening there, you know. Yeah, I was around. We did a big show at the Pantages in Los Angeles, and it was Rick Rubin and Joe Strummer was there and Rollins. In fact, Kenny, in fact, I, Chuck Mead and I produced a tribute to Waylon, and we got Henry to do a song on it, which was great, you know, fantastic. Oh, well, he understood the connection immediately, I mean, because they're actually what great-grandchildren of him, you know what I mean, yeah. with especially their um, presentation, if you will, the all black stuff and all that, and they and they just felt the same thing. I mean, everybody came. We played in Ireland, and U two came, and Bono sat in with us. Everybody was on board, man. Everybody wanted it to work, and that's why it worked because everybody wanted it to work. Do you remember the last time you saw Cash? Uh, was would have been in the studio about a week before he died. I can't remember what we did, but he was fine. I mean, he was just, he was wearing out and he had stopped dyeing his hair and stuff like that. So you could see how much he had aged. I still say he just missed June. I mean, when she passed away before him, we were all shocked that she went first for one thing, because she was so healthy all the time. And when she passed away, the change in him was absolutely noticeable. You know? Yeah. Fergie called me. Dave Ferguson, the great producer here. He just called me and said, John passed away last night. You know? I was with playing with Dwight, and we, speaking of the private jet, we both just said, we got to go to the... I said, I got to go home, man. I can't... You're going to have to get somebody else. He said, I'll do do you better than that. I'll cancel two dates, and we'll get on the plane and go. And we went together and came back. He made my day doing that for me. I felt like that was just an amazing gesture. I just love loved to uh, tell the story about Ring of Fire. And if you play slap bass rockabilly, I'll give you a little demonstration. The more open strings you have, the easier it is on you. So like if he used to do it in G, so it would be It's really easy if you have those open strings. It makes it sound more powerful. Well, all of a sudden, as Johnny got older, his voice was dropping, so he wanted to raise the key on it. And so, which doesn't, which involves no open strings. It puts it from G to A flat, 
which makes it terribly difficult. So it was like. <laughs> to show people how the difference and as opposed to that you know so sounds better in the open but he just wanted an a flat and i said oh man because i i wasn't very good and i couldn't play an a flat quite yet you know and all that so we were backstage and i was struggling through it and he goes does that new key um suit you man and i said well i explained it to him what i just said i said you know in a flat there's no open string but when you did it in g it was great Classic rockabilly thing, you know, folk keys they call them, like G D E A, you know. So, so I was telling him the story. I said, Johnny, you know, it was so easy playing G because of all those open strings. He says, Well, show me. So I showed him what I just showed y'all, and I said, Man, I really miss it being in G. He said, Show me that in A flat again. So he's going. Mm -hmm. he said, it's a lot harder to do it in A flat, isn't it, Dave? And I said, It is. He goes, You know what, man? I'm really not concerned with that. And I just, I fell on the floor, man. And the good news is, is it helped me get better in a couple of new keys, as, as it were, you know, which I took further, you know. But he, I just love that interaction we had. It was, I'm really not concerned with that, Dave. Yeah. Well, I had moved here in December of 81 from my hometown of Honolulu. And I went to a jam session the first Monday I was in town. And somebody in the band, Paul Franklin, the, steel, the great steel player, called him up. And I was doing this slap funk stuff. You know, not, not, not that I'm great at it. I was just happened to be one of the first guys to get in town that could do that stuff. And, and he was looking for that. And Paul called him that next morning and said, you need to hire this guy for your new band. And Reed called me. It was one of those crazy out random things. So, you know, they say this is a two, three year town before you get a gig or get, start making money. Man, I got so lucky I got that gig. The first week I was in town, it was like amazing. So I did that. And one thing about playing with somebody as good as Jerry Reed, you never have to audition again. I came from a rhythm and blues background in Hawaii, but I love country music so much because of my mom's record collection that once every couple of years, I would put a country band together with the guys that were available that over there that could actually play the stuff. And we toured, which meant getting in the van and driving to all the military bases because around Oahu, because that was the only place you could play country music. So when I got here, and I actually was the first guy he hired for that new band, and uh, it was easy for me because I helped him do all the auditions that came up further. So by the time the band was formulated in its full, you know, in its f full blownness, I uh, already knew all the stuff. It was easy. He was just funny, and he was huge at the time. People for 10, you know, it's been 40 years now, but he was an arena act back then and a movie star and all that stuff. So that was my first taste of the big time. So it was nothing but fun. It was great. Oh, God, he couldn't go on a truck stop at that point. We had to get food for him. I mean, we were, we, we, we just didn't, we got to where we just didn't tell anybody who was on the bus because people would start mobbing the bus because he was big time because that was Smokey and the Bandit time and all that junk. He was on fire. Well, he was particular about gear in the sense that we were a 100% PV band because at the time, PV d dominated the South at least, you know. And I learned a lot of respect for that company because, man, they would just pull up to town and a semi and hand, it, hand out gear to all the, uh, uh, all the great country musicians, which was the greatest marketing campaign you could ever come up with because there's guys to this day that still use that stuff, you know. And uh, it, he was... He tried out a lot of different guitars, but the period I played with him, he was not playing acoustic stuff like he's famous for. He was playing electric guitar, and we had a three-guitar attack. It was a lot of triple leads. It was developed beyond belief, just triple leads. And then sometimes he'd go, let's do the second one we practiced. And the guys would go, oh, my God, they have to play all this stuff. But if you want to see that band, it's there's a, a Austin City Limits uh concert footage of uh, us on YouTube in 1982. And it's it's amazing. It's a great, great performance on his part, especially because he was at the height of his powers. Then, you know. He was using flat pick at that time, doing the George Benson style stuff. So I didn't, I rarely got to see him play the gut string stuff when I was there. It just wasn't there. Then he went back to it later, obviously. So, I mean, on those hillbilly buses, especially back then, 
it was nothing but fun. Everything was still pretty crazy back then, partying and just and country music was, in my opinion, heading towards its last heyday, which would have been the '90s. So a lot of that stuff was in play. Got to open shows or headline shows with just about everybody. So I got it. Really expanded my my circle of friends and and also whatever it meant, my own personal notoriety, which helped me later. You know, he was pretty good about letting anybody play what they want unless he had specific stuff in mind. I remember him one time I was getting a little too busy on a song and he just looked at me and said, son, you're getting too cute. Let's, let's have some stupid bass. Come on, man. Yeah. So it was a fine line because it was a country band, but in a weird sort of way, it was a fusion band. You know, it was really a high end musical experience. I mean, it was, you could not play in that band and just be a regular country musician. You just couldn't do it. You had to have as many influences as possible. And a lot of it was funk and rhythm and blues because that's part of him that people tend to overlook, you know, because he was, a, he, I remember hearing uh, Amos Moses in 67 or 68 and thinking, what in the hell is that? It was on American Bandstand and I ran into the living room and looked and, and here's this white dude playing like a black guy and singing like one and the song was great. And, and, and I, I remember it wasn't a portent of anything for me because obviously I had no clue where my life was going to go at that point. But I remember thinking, this guy is really something else, you know. I mean, he's easily, the him and Chet are the two most influential guitar players in this. I think combined they invented modern guitar, country guitar. Oh, yeah, all, uh, yeah, all the way. They got they won a Grammy a few years later for two guitar a two-guitar record they made. Yeah. They, they were friends to the end, yeah. Everybody in that band ended up becoming major session players. Or one guy, one of the guys, one of the guitar players, uh, is the band leader at the Grand Ole Opry House Band. Now, I mean, it just goes on and on. You know, everybody in that band was amazing. I learned a lot playing with those guys on guitar. Kerry Marks, and then we had the Blackman Brothers, who were a bluegrass brother duo from Georgia, playing fiddle and guitar, and then banjo and guitar, respectively. And then Rick McClure on drums. Mike White on percussion and Bob Patan on uh, keyboards. The whole thing was beyond interesting for me because he ended up being my father-in-law for 13 years. And he's the grandfather of my son, Jerry, who is now the number one session drummer in Nashville. He's on every record on the radio. Now it's ludicrous, you know. So my perspective is a little bit different. I started dating his daughter and we agreed that I should leave the band. And I went on and, you know, and, in his defense about all that, I understood how he felt about having somebody in the band that was dating his daughter. He got me the gig with my second gig when when we agreed to part ways. He got me my second gig, which was with Chet Atkins. So there was no complaints from me anywhere about any of that. But, you know, tour buses are weird in the sense that everybody thinks we're part, riding down the road partying and listening to music and stuff. Man, most of the guys that play in those bands, music is 24-7 with them. You don't really hear much on the buses. You might hear people sitting and practicing, but thank God. Because, you know, you get off stage playing a loud show, the last thing you want to do is fire up the stereo, you know. So it's just nobody I've worked for had that going on. Nobody, you know. What were the stage volumes like with Jerry? Pretty loud. The guitar playing was really, it was it was rock and roll delivery for, for sure, you know. So with the PV amps that he was playing, what, you remember what particular ones? Um, the specials, I think that rings a bell. You know, the 130 specials or whatever they're called. And I had a big PV bass rig. Everybody was PV to hell, you know, it's like amazing. Because um, PV sort of revolutionized that whole thing of country guitar. They sounded pretty good. I mean, Brent Mason still uses them, man. I mean, you know, 130 specials, I think is what it is. You could throw them down a flight of stairs. You cannot kill a PV amplifier. I got a ba fin PV bass amp. I can sleep at night knowing that I've got a good bass amp still, and I don't play it anymore, but it's like, they're great, man. Fantastic. My wife and I, uh, his daughter got divorced in 96, and he died when, like, five or six years ago? I never got any animosity from him, really, you know, about all that stuff. He wasn't happy about it. He had, I mean, every father has different designs for their daughters other than marrying a touring musician, you know, so. But uh, he, uh, it was always great. You know, then my son became really successful and he he just looked at it like he had a little dynasty happening with all of us. And it was great. You know, well, what I know is, is that the colonel and Elvis made it a point to co-op writing credits on all the on the covers they 
you know, if there was a writer who had a song they wanted to do, you had to give them half the publishing, and which was a standard practice, still is in a lot of a lot of ways. But uh, Reed Reed had learned from Chet to never give away your publishing because that's where the big money is, especially back then, you know. And Jerry's holds the record for the amount of cuts Elvis cut. He cut four of Reed's songs, you know, Tupelo Mississippi Flash, Guitar Man, Thing Called Love, and there was one other one, and. Uh, Felton Jarvis went in the studio, who was their producer guy. They hired Reed to play parts on Guitar Man because Elvis was completely infatuated with Reed because they were really similar, kind of, you know, Southern boys playing their form of rhythm and blues, really. And uh, he just said, I, we got we to gotta get some paperwork going here because uh, Elvis always gets half the song. And Reed just said, no. And so Kurt, the Colonel supposedly said, well, we, these, these songs aren't going on the record then, sorry. And Elvis just stood up and vetoed them the first and I think only time he got his way on that. He said, no, we're cutting these songs. I love them. Give him his money. You know, so there you have it. One of my favorite stories on the road was uh, the first Farm Aid. And I, I mentioned earlier that all of 1985, I played with uh, Vern Gostin. And Vern, if you don't know anything about Vern, he started out. In, the, in a duo with his brother called the Gostin Brothers, and they were famous in the bluegrass world and country world. And they were in L.A., and he was right up in the middle of all the bird stuff, you know, the sweetheart of the rodeo stuff and Gosden Brothers. Chris Hillman in the birds was in a bluegrass band with them, and they even, a lot of people don't buy this, but they even, the last two or three birds albums, they actually sang the harmony on a lot of it because those guys couldn't get along in the studio anymore. So the Gosdens had a, in fact, Vern was with Clarence White, when he got killed in the parking lot of that club where he got run over and it was deep, the birds thing with them. And so, uh, McGuinn was around a lot with Vern. He'd show up and play and, and Hillman was around a lot cause Vern liked to use the desert rose band. So I had a lot of interaction with Hillman and some interaction with McGuinn. But the best thing was, is we got booked to do farm aid, the 1985, the very first one. And McGuinn came, Vern said, Roger, why don't you come down and, We'll learn four or five of your songs. And, uh, you know, and we were the first act to play, the opening act at the first farm. And it was going to be telecasted on TNN. But we were told ahead of time that we would not be part of the televised part because they had saved all that resources and energy for the big acts. And there was some big shit going on then. It was 85. Bon Jovi was a headliner there who I got to meet who was really nice. And the biggest that thing that happened that a lot of people don't remember, it was the first night that Sammy Hagar played with Van Halen. That was their first live show together. So here's how it happened. There's two or three things that happened that night that were just extraordinary. The practical joke shit on the road can get really deep. And it was really deep and thick with the Gosden crew. They were just, man, you just, you had to be on guard all the time. You could end up with shit in your face, you know. So him and him and uh, McGuinn hatched this thing. Since it didn't matter, we weren't going to be on TV. We knew, and they they detuned my bass. I tuned it, and they gave a couple bucks to the techs to detune it. So when I hit the first Mister Tambourine Man was the first song. When I hit that first thing, that dude, it was all it was so fucked up. I was standing there going, and it took me a minute. Then I looked over at them, and they're all just dying laughing. So I struggled for two songs to get back in tune, and we did our stuff, and it was okay. But what happened was, the funny part about it was when Van Halen came out, Sammy Hagar steps up to the microphone and goes, How y'all doing? We're the new Van Halen. This song goes out to all you tractor-driving motherfuckers. And TN, TNN just cut it and started running us. And there I was banging on the back, trying to tune the bass. I've tried to find footage of it, but I think because of Sammy Cussing, you can't find any of that footage anymore. And I think they're still in litigation about who owns those shows, the farm aid stuff. But man, it was just great, man. I just stood there and I was like, you mother. And I got home and turned the TV and there we were. They didn't even allude to the fact that Van Halen was there because of what happened. And we were the first act and I'm standing back, and they're just dying laughing. So that was egg on your face time on that one. The general program is you move here when you're young, you tour for 10 years, and then you work your way into the studio so you don't have to be on the road anymore. And, and my story turned out to be kind of that way, except it took me 15, 20 years to get my session work happening. 
But I just went through a series of major gigs. I did uh, Jerry Reed first, Chet, like I said. Then I did Dottie West for a year, which was really great because I just absolutely adored her and loved her music. Then I did my first stint with Vern Gosden, and who's easily, to me, the greatest country singer ever. And I just uh, couldn't get it going. I, after that, I did all 85 with him, and then I tried to get in the studio for three years, and I couldn't, so I went back with Vern and played the next up through 92. And uh, interesting story about Vern is is uh, I was his band leader for four or five years, and I, I hired and fired over 60 drummers. He had a thing about drummers. We ended up the last 18 months, two years I was there, I was operating a drum machine because he was convinced no drummer could play his fucking music, which was ludicrous. And then I went and did a gig with him at the old Geo Theater at Opryland. And he walked over to me while somebody was soloing or something and said, I don't care what you say. That machine is speeding up. And I just remember thinking, I got to get out of here. Johnny had a history of Waylon would open for him or Willie would open for all those guys. Chris was around a lot. I played on some Chris Christopherson stuff. You know, it was, uh, they were always around and always great to be around. And Waylon, Waylon was great. He was just, of all those guys, I think I liked him the best. I love it. 60s Waylon is hard to beat, man. You know, just unbelievable. Was he personable? Great. One of the greatest guys ever. We did a TV show on TNN where Johnny and them did Ain't No Good Chain Gang together. And I was slapping. He wanted me to slap bass, so I did that. And I remember laying my bass down, and somebody came up from behind me and picked me up and threw me over his shoulder. And, man, I'm 6'2", and 200 pounds, and he just starts walking down the hallway, and I'm going. And Cash goes, well, what are you doing? He said, so I'm stealing your bass player, son. So, and it, it was funny and a compliment, you know. Oops, Oops sorry about that. All right. But, uh, yeah, I liked Waylon a lot, man. I just, he's one of my favorites. There's no doubt about it. I was only around him three or four times, and the TV show was the closest I got to him, and I was just hanging in the shadows, listening to him and Johnny talk. You know, it was fun. You know. I got the Dwight Yoakam gig. Uh, do you know who Keith Gaddis is? Dwight wanted to go to a small band, not all the guitars and all the steels and all that crap. And he wanted to put together... And I think Cash influenced this. He wanted to go back to a sort of a rockabilly three-piece plus him, so four including him. And Keith Gaddis was a guy that I had done a lot of work for here. He moved to Los Angeles. Let me give a little plug to Keith. He's got a record called Big City Blues. It's one of the best records ever made. It's unbelievable. But he, kind of, he Dwight fell in love with Pete, Keith. Found They found a good drummer. I said, we got to get it. I want, a, I want an upright bass, man. He said, I want slap bass on everything, you know? So he said, you need to get Dave, bro. So I didn't have to audition. I just showed up in L.A., and there I was. And I was surprised, actually, because his bass was his music was all electric bass, you know, all of it. And he just said, I said, well, what should I do? He said, boom, chicky, man, give me the Johnny Cash shit, and we'll just rework the songs that way. And it was explosive. Was this right around Sling Blade? 2000 to 2005. Sling Blade had already happened. And, and a lot of actors, you know, like backstage, most bands have musicians come, and he had a combination of actors, and we got got to see. I got to meet Vince Vaughn and Jeff Bridges, and uh, of course, uh, Billy Billy Bob Thornton was around a lot. All those guys were around. The big thrill for me was we played San Antonio, and Tommy Lee Jones came, and I'm a big Tommy Lee Jones fan, and he came right up in my face and said, "You're a good hand, brother. You're a good hand," and I just wanted to die. It was great. He was an impressive human being, man. Yeah. I'm going to forget the name of the character, but the scene in Sling Blade of uh, Dwight with his band is like the most accurate uh, local band thing. It's everybody's been through that. And, that, and in a lot of ways, it was when Dwight would get pissed off, which he would do sometimes, that's that's who it was. <laughs> and a lot, and every, everybody will tell you that, you know. I think Billy, I remember asking Billy Bob, you know, and he just said, man, I saw him chewing out his band one time. I said, that's my guy right there. Because Dwight is a great actor. I mean, I mean, of all the guys that dabbled in both, I'd say he's probably the best. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. I, just going uh, to the point of what I just said, he was a little tough to work with sometimes, but I'm going to tell you something. He's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And I mean, it. I guarantee you he's a Mensa. He's, he's just 
over the charts. He's well informed, well educated, and the most generous guy I ever worked for. I mean, his presence at Christmas time and when we flew into somewhere, he stayed at the Four Seasons and we stayed with him or the Ritz Carlton. He never penny anted us about anything. So most money I ever made touring, he was generous there. He was just I got nothing bad to say about him. I loved him, you know. And singing with him, which is my other thing that I do. I did all the background vocals with Cash, mostly with Vern, which I learned a lot from about singing country harmony. And I was the main singer with Dwight. So Dwight was probably the best singer I ever sang with. Flawless. Never made a mistake. Ever. Not once. His shit always sounds good. It's just perfection. Was yeah. he particular about the backing vocals? Yes. We would work him out a little bit. Because of my experience, that style of harmony, my experience with Gosden got me through all of that. He just, and he had seen fit video of me singing with Gosden. He said, that's what the, I want you to do the same thing here. And that's what I did. The singing part was easy. Remembering all the words was hard. <laughs> It was loud for some of the same reasons with Cash. Speaking of PV, Dwight loved to play his acoustic guitar through this monstrous 1,000-watt PV thing that sat amongst the, one on each side of the drums, if I remember correctly. It was so fucking loud that they couldn't put it in the in the front of house. And I think to this day that's, that's an issue that they deal with. But then Gaddis played through two big Fender amps, and I, I was... I played through it, amp, amp again, and it was loud. It was punchy, you know, but very clean. And the way he, you know, how his music's so arranged and it was just really neat. It was not as uh, chaotic as the cash stuff because the cash stuff was, there were never any count offs. It was just, let's go, bang, and you fall in. We called it falling in. And, but Dwight was much more precise and precision. A little bit taking that model from the cash model, but, you know, still keeping Dwight's OCD, if you will, about everything. Yeah. And I love Dwight. I think he's one of the most talented people ever. I still think he was the last great country artist. You know, okay. It was hilarious. I mean, it was just a bunch of hillbillies riding around on a jet plane. It was great. And Dwight loved it, and he took pride in knowing everything about the jets he was on. He he was a, sort of an amateur jet fan. And he could tell you everything about a Learjet, and it was interesting talking to him about it. Did Buck Owens ever uh, come around? No, but we came to him. We played at the, the Palace in Bakersfield a couple times, and Buck was there both times. It was uh, pretty cool to meet him. He's another one of my big heroes. But he did not play both those nights that we were there. He had already pretty much hung up his guitar by that point. He was not well, I don't think. where He was at the beginning stages of his, of his decline, I think. But he was great getting to talk to him and hang out. He was cool, man. He was really funny. It was Keith Gaddis on guitar, and then he left because he got a record deal with RCA, and Eddie Perez from the Mavericks came in, and he was the second guitar player I worked with. But it was they were both so great, it didn't matter. I mean, you know. So I was there like five years, and when I left, Eddie was the guitar player. 